Hello and welcome to Coronanomics, brought to you by Econ Films. This week, trade and peace. The idea that trade leads to peace between nations goes back at least as far as Plutarch, 2,000 years ago. In the modern era, it was fundamental to the thinking behind the post-war Marshall Plan, the foundation of the European Union, and America's economic engagement with China. But since the start of the pandemic, global trade seems to have suffered the largest hit since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So where does that leave relations between countries, great and small? I'm Ben Chu, Economics Editor of The Independent. And I'm Lizzie Burden, Economics Reporter at The Telegraph. We'll be your guides, and if you like what we're doing, please hit the subscribe button as it helps people find us. Joining us this week is Pascal Lamy, President of the Paris Peace Forum, who was Director General of the World Trade Organization during the financial crisis, and before that was EU Trade Commissioner. Pascal Lamy, welcome to Coronanomics. Now, Mr. Lamy, I want to start with the recent call by the UN Secretary General to the G20. He asked that body to waive sanctions that could prevent countries from fighting the uh, pandemic. Countries like Iran, Venezuela and Syria all say that their ability to respond to COVID is massively weakened by US or other international sanctions. Do you, uh, Mr. Lamy, have any sympathy with that call? Should the pandemic be a reset moment in international relations? Uh, Many of us with the dream answering uh, yes to your question, uh, I'm afraid the answer is unfortunately no. Uh, We had problems in international relations, multilateralism, was already not in good shape before the COVID crisis. And what I get from the many conversations, uh, seminars, uh, webinars, I participate with many colleagues on many continents on the world after COVID, assuming there is a world after COVID, which, as we know, may be uh, a bit of a longer horizon than we expected a few uh, months ago, uh, the world post-COVID will be more fragmented, will be more difficult. The US-China rivalry has, and you said it rightly, uh, not benefited from this crisis. Uh, The fact that uh, many emerging or developing countries will have been hit much harder than China or Europe or US because their own capacity to borrow the large amounts, which I already mentioned, will make the North-South divide more difficult, more complex, as we know, and you uh, rightly underlined it, uh, the UN Security Council has been pretty ineffective. The G7 and the G20 are basically nowhere. I've been participant in internet for 30 years since I uh, was a G7 Sherpa uh, in, uh, in the end of the 1980s. I've never seen such a low level of international cooperation. That's one of the reasons why we have structured the Paris Peace Forum agenda this year around a number of global issues like health, like cyber, like the impact of the crisis on developing countries in order to try and get a bit of better outcome to something which, frankly speaking, uh, looks very bleak at this stage. One area of trade that's undoubtedly caused diplomatic tension is Brexit. Um, And the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that a no deal Brexit would be no bad thing um, and that it's looking increasingly likely. We've got a clip of him now. Well, I just think there's a a good uh, agreement to be reached. Uh, uh, But obviously, if we can't, then then we we will have the the very good option also of uh, an Australian style arrangement. As a former WTO Director General, I wonder on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most likely, what you see the chances of Britain trading with the EU on WTO terms as now, um, and how bad do you think that would be for the UK? Well, uh, if I may correct you, Lizzie, it's not trade that creates diplomatic tension. Businesses overall on this planet want to trade, they like to trade, they grow their business. If I do something better than you do, and if you do something better than I do, we have a perfectly rational interest to trade. 
and you and me will trade. I will benefit from your know-how, you will benefit from my know-how. It's not trade that creates problems, it's problems in other areas that create problems for trade, and Brexit is an extremely good example of that. Uh, the United Kingdom was one of the main actors, promoters, and benefiters from the EU internal market, uh, which led to borders disappearing uh, within uh, the European Union. It's not for economic reasons that the UK decided to leave the internal market. It's not for trade reasons. The UK people were very happy with their trade relationship within the internal market. They decided it for political reasons. Recovering the sovereignty that had been given to Brussels was the right thing to do for the future of the United Kingdom. So trade is a consequence of this political choice. And the UK now has the option of either leaving the internal market big way, i.e. adopting norms and standards, which is what matters for the economies of scale of a supply chain today, big or small. If UK decides to diverge from EU standards big, the border will be thick and costly. If UK decides to diverge from EU standards little, the border will be thick. This is an issue which is entirely in the hands of the UK people. They have to choose what sort of economic and trade consequences will occur from their political choices. Now, to your question, is trading between UK and EU under WTO terms, a good thing or not. It depends on which league you want to play soccer. If you like the game, and if you like very good players, you will go to the first league. Uh, <laughs> if you have less money to spend, or if you're not such a big fan, you can watch a match of second, third, fourth league. It still is soccer. It still is trading, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a minor version of what could be great. But that's again in the hands of uh, the United Kingdom and of the European Union, who from the very beginning said there's one thing we will not change because of Brexit, which is the way we run our internal market, will adjust the size of the border to the consequences of more or less divergence in standards. This is not mostly a tariff issue. This has to do with pesticide residues, with safety of lighters with the size of bumpers, uh, with what sort of license do you need to become an accountant or a doctor or a teacher. This is a major trade issue, notably given uh, the huge importance of services uh, for the UK economy and for its international exchange. So a relegation for Britain on the cards then, <laughs> says Mr. Lamy. Um, one of the specific worries if there's no trade deal was expressed in a leaked letter um, from Britain's Trade Secretary Liz Truss to other cabinet ministers. And she said that the legality of the UK's plan for a phased approach to checks on goods coming into the UK from the EU in the first half of next year could be challenged at the WTO. And her concern is that because the UK plans to temporarily give the EU de facto preferential treatment, that could be a breach of WTO rules. Are her concerns valid? A lot of people say that there'll never be a case. And I wonder if you think that's complacent. Article 24 of the WTO statute allows for preferential regime to be established between WTO members, provided they cover essentially all trade. Mm -hmm. So that's the technical answer. There is absolutely no WTO objection to two WTO members, and EU and UK are two WTO members, to establish uh, trade relations which are on better terms than the World Trade Organization. Where I sit, listening and talking to business people, more than to politicians on the UK side, the question is, how much time do I have to adjust? 
How much is it going to cost me to adjust to the new system? What if there is no transition and this has to happen overnight, which will be a big mess, is a much bigger economic question than whether you choose the Canadian model or the Indian model or the Japanese model or the Chinese model. At the end of the day, it's not governments that trade, it's businesses. And that their life will be terrible in case there is no serious transition between the nirvana of the internal EU market, which is where the EU, UK economy is for the moment, and anything which would be that. It should be worse than that, but it's going to be much worse if there is not a proper transition organized. And I think both sides have a totally rational interest to organize a proper transition. And my experience in trade deal, all trade deals I negotiated, all uh, overseen uh, for the last uh, 30 years of my life, have always had at least a five or six year transition implementation progressivity in the way you move from trade regime A to trade regime B. That's, I think, the real big question if, if you want to look at reality and not just Sunday speeches. It's interesting because this was a massive issue in the UK. It's shown huge divides in the British government between the Trade Secretary and Michael Gove, the Cabinet Secretary, who's leading on Brexit. Just to clarify, are you saying that the Trade Secretary's concerns are wrong? What I'm saying, what I'm saying, uh, Lizzie, is what I hear from business. Governments do not trade. Businesses trade. And what matters, what matters at the end of the day for the economy and for the people and, and for the standard of living and how much people make and how much taxes they pay is the vibrancy of the economy. So if I have to listen to a voice on what should be done and how should it be done and how should we create the modalities that will accompany this change. I will listen to business. These are the people who know how much it will cost to them, how long will the lorry files will be if you move overnight, how costly it will be uh, to put uh, big bumpers on uh, UK produced cars instead of the small bumpers, uh, how much will UK want to diverge from the birds protection directive, uh, which is a big EU regulation and which will probably raise a bit of a question on the UK side. This is the real issue. Whether it's the Secretary <laughs> for Trade or Mr. Gov, who's right or wrong, the answer to this question is in the hands of business people. That's extremely interesting. Let's talk briefly, though, about vaccines and trade, uh, Mr. Lamy. Many countries have been accused of vaccine nationalism in this crisis. The US, the UK and even the EU. They've, of course, been striking deals with pharmaceutical companies to ensure their own nations or communities get any supplies first. What are your thoughts on that? If we do get a vaccine, should it go to whoever needs it most, wherever they are on the planet? Or is that um, utopian? And what's the role of global governance and the WTO in issues such as this? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I belong to a group of people who are behind an initiative uh, which is called ACT, which is access uh, to the COVID vaccine, which is promoted by a number of European countries, including France, the World Health Organization. The answer to the question of whether a vaccine could legally be made available to all is yes, there is in the trade related intellectual property agreement of the WTO a clause, and I know that because I renegotiated it in order to open it a bit more in the 90s when I was European Trade Commissioner, and that was part of a deal which launched the around. There is an issue, there is a system which is called compulsory licensing, where I am a normal country. I have a normal pharma industry. I have a huge sanitary problem. 
I go to my pharma industry and tell, can you provide the vaccine for everybody? They say yes. Okay. They say no. I have the government authority to establish a compulsory license which obliges this company by law to provide the vaccine in conditions of price and volume, which I, as a government, establish. Now, transposing this to the international level is perfectly doable. Countries that do not have a pharma industry have also the possibility of issuing import compulsory licensing. I want to turn now to the race to become the next Director General of the WTO. We can't not ask you about it. You've hinted previously that the next DG needs to have the political clout to run the organisation. And you've also noted that there's never previously been an African Director General. Two Bucky's favourites at the moment are the Nigerian candidate Ngozi Onkodjuwawala and the Kenyan candidate Amina Mohamed. They both fit that bill. They've both served in high level government positions. I wonder what else you think the Director General should have? Well, you well tried, uh, well tried, Lizzie. Uh, but you will, <laughs> you'll not extract from me any uh, public uh, expression of a preference, although, of course, I have one, as I should. Uh, and I care enough, again, uh, still, for uh, the health and the good being of the international trade system, which is not in that a good shape, uh, to hope that they will select the best among the eight candidates, which, by the way, is a very good fit for an organization which Mr. Trump has tried to destabilize, if not to kill, and who's been named moribund by the US trade representative, uh, having such a field of good, competent, uh, dynamic, and well-rated people uh, competing for the DG is a good sign. Now, it's okay, you can tell us after. <laughs> <laughs> what is the ideal profile? The ideal profile is somebody with long recognized international experience, with political experience, and with a temper that is an active one. The WTO has zillions of problems to solve, which it has not solved in recent times for reasons, which, by the way, uh, for a lot of them have nothing to do uh, with the authority of the DG, although the DG can marginally uh, improve a, a situation or remain passive, which will not improve the situation. I'm quite optimistic that uh, given the people who are there, given the fact that there are among them women and quite a large number of extremely good women, uh, which is, I think, a good sign of times, Again, international experience, international network, recognition, extremely good connections with capitals, which given the size of problems WTO has to solve, cannot be less just left to trade ambassadors. In good times, you know, the midship, uh, which uh, ambassadors, uh, trade ambassadors are, can run the ship. In bad times, you need the captain. You need to talk to the highest authority. And this is what the next WTG will have to do. Mm. But the WTO couldn't even agree an interim leader when Roberto Azevedo steps down. Um, instead, the membership agreed to extend the terms of the four deputies past um, Roberto Azevedo's departure without putting any single one of them in charge. So isn't the race already in chaos? Do you think that at the end we'll actually end up with a director general? It's a, it's a typical case where US and China uh, played uh, I block you, you block me. Mm. Uh, I don't think it was very clever from the US side uh, to propose a US deputy as the interim DG, although he's a guy I respect a lot and he, he has a vast trade expertise how, given the behavior of the Trump administration, how could the Chinese have accepted that the interim DG of WTO is an American? From the very beginning, does it really matter? It matters as a signal that China and US have a problem. 
nothing really new. Does it really matter for the period to come? No, because anyhow, the, the deputy DG, which will have to run the WTO, is the one in charge of the budget and HR resources. It's the administration of the WTO for the weeks and the months to come that matters. Nothing will happen at the political level. So the reality is that the deputy DG, uh, which will run the shop, is the one that runs uh, the budget and the resources. So be it. This is a logistical issue. I don't think it's a big problem. And you've said previously that US President Donald Trump's threat to withdraw from the WTO is an empty threat. Um, but isn't it the case that the US's approach to the WTO wouldn't change that much under a Biden administration? You mentioned earlier that you have some sympathy with US frustration with the state of the organisation and the need for reform. Absolutely. And I think, whereas I would not agree uh, with this sort of overall trade policy, criticism, deglobalization, decoding, uh, which is the ideology, the trade ideology of Mr. Trump. And I strongly disagree with that as a trade expert. I do agree that the US are right that the rules of WTO do not discipline enough some countries, but some countries are right to believe that the WTO rules do not discipline enough the US in some sectors. What would change with a Biden administration would not be the fact that the US have a problem or that others have a problem. What would change is the way to address this problem. Mm -hmm. There is a huge difference between torpedoing a system, destroying a system, and sitting around the table to find a solution where you have a problem. It's a question of attitude much more than a question of substance. The substance would remain the problem to address, but the way to get there would be different. It was the case in the 19th century, and it has left very bad memories on the Chinese side. You have to convince China that improving the WTO rules is necessary for keeping the trade of China with the rest of the world open. China needs to understand that if the field is unlevel in some areas because they don't want to accept changes and strengthening of some disciplines, then the benefits of open trade, which have accrued in zillions for China, as well mm. as by the rest of the world, will not be available anymore. It's, it's a campaign about persuading and not a campaign uh, with a sort of uh, big pattern, which I think uh, has not worked and will not work. Mm. Well, we didn't get your uh, final conclusion on who you would like to see in the DG chair, but you can't blame us for trying. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, conversation, uh, which ranged very wide. And I think we've gone into much more detail than is usually gone on to on the sort of the philosophy underpinning trade as well as the mechanics of it. So thank you so much, Pascal Lamy, for appearing on Coronanomics. We'll be talking to many more top thinkers in the weeks ahead to discuss how we can weather the economic storm of COVID-19. So please do stay tuned and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember, if you like what we're doing, please hit like and share. And if you'd like to talk to us, just leave us a comment below. This has been Coronanomics brought to you by Econ Films.